Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 6. But before we, we begin, let us ask the Lord's blessing on the reading of his word today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the freedom we have to read your scriptures aloud. Bless Albert as he preaches your word this morning and give us ears that hear and hearts that are willing to obey. In your name we pray these things. Amen. I ask that you follow along on the overhead screen in your Bibles or at the bottom of your screen if you've joined us by video link. Ephesians chapter 6 starting at verse 5. Bond servants, obey your masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word today. We are nearing the end, actually, of this letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, a letter that was circulated to other churches at the time as well. And in this letter, the Apostle Paul has basically been saying that you do not become a Christian because of your moral efforts or how a good of a work that you do, that it's not up to you, but it's up to actually God's grace that you can be saved. That God graciously takes spiritually dead people, which is all of us apart from his work, and makes us spiritually alive by opening our eyes to see Jesus, by giving us hearts that can believe that he really has done everything necessary so we can be forgiven and declared right before God. That we have new life given, spiritual life given by God as a gift of grace. And Paul says, as a result of that, because that's true, Christians ought to be people who live different in their lives. That if you're a Christian, that should result in a different way of having a daily life that reflects the grace that has been given to you and the way that you've been saved. And the, the last half of this letter, the Apostle Paul has then taken a whole bunch of different areas of everyday life and said, because you have been saved by grace, because you've been given new life by Jesus, because you are united to Jesus by faith and you are a new creation, because there's a new self that fights against the old self, there is a new way to live. And that new way to live has involved how we speak and how we act, how we relate to people in our relationships, in our marriages. Every part of our human reality is affected by it. Last week, we looked at family. The week before, marriage a bunch of times. Before that, uh, we saw that in terms of being able to live a new life in light of God's grace and mercy rather than experiencing his wrath. Every part of how we live, dealing with guilt and shame, everything is being covered. And yet the Apostle Paul still has a few more areas to cover. Today we're looking at this one, bond servants or slaves and masters. We'll get into that in a minute. And then in the weeks to come, what he calls a spiritual battle, the battle between principalities and powers that's not flesh and blood, which will be actually the next number of weeks to come. But today the Apostle Paul is looking at this part of life because in that day, People would have been in that church in Ephesus and they would have been both slaves and masters. Bond servants is another word for slave. We'll get into what that means. But here the Apostle Paul is basically saying, look, I understand that you have in your church in Ephesus both people who are slaves, bond servants, and people who are masters. And this is how you ought to live your lives if you're a Christian. That if you're a Christian, how you live as a slave or how you live as a master should be different. And what that looks like Paul describes for us here, and we're going to get into that. But before we do that, 
I think it's important, considering our context and considering the day and age we live in, to actually take a moment and ask ourselves some pretty difficult questions. And that's this first one. Does the Bible, in a passage like this, promote or condone slavery? Does the Bible actually say that slavery is okay? That it's maybe even a good thing? That it's okay? That God actually is fine with it? I mean, there are people who have made that claim. There are people who have made that claim as Christians. There are people who actually use that claim to keep people as slaves and their property and to misuse them and mistreat them. So what do you do with that? Does this passage promote, condone slavery? Does the Bible as a whole do that? Some people claim it does, both Christians and non-Christians. And I think it's only worthwhile and it's important for us to do it that we take a few moments as our first main point today and say, does the Bible do that? And I'm going to bring you through a little bit of a survey very quickly through it. And then we're going to look back at the passage and we're going to say, okay, considering what we've just heard, what would it look like for us here today to live this passage out? Whether we're bond servants or slaves or whether we're masters and what that means and how that applies and how that actually comes out in our daily lives today, I think I'll be able to make a connection for you to see that that's actually something that you can still think about and work through in your daily life here and now, even though most of us would probably be able to say we have a hard time connecting to the slaves and the masters that we hear about here in this passage. And the big thing that's going to come through, I hope, through all of this is that through all of these things, these are not just ideas that we're talking about. This is not just something that we're learning about so we can learn some more information. But all of these things, as Paul's written them, are all meant to point us back to Jesus over and over again. That this passage only makes sense when you understand who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he says, and how he can change our lives, even in relationships of slaves and masters back then, and in the equivalent of what we'll look at today. And so let's jump in. Point number one, does the Bible promote, condone slavery? Does this passage in particular and others as a Bible as a whole do that? And I think it's, it's important for you to understand and hear from me today that yes, people have made that claim, even Christians have made that claim. And I would argue that when we look at the Bible as a whole and we look at passages like this today, the Bible is not promoting or condoning slavery at all. And that those who make those claims are either not really Christians or do not understand their Bibles enough. We might say even they're not Christian enough. You say, well, how can I make that claim? Well, let me just bring you through a few examples. The first uh, mention of slavery in the Bible that we really get to is in the book of Genesis. I'm not going to do every book of the Bible, don't worry. But I'm going to hit you some highlights, okay? The first one is Genesis. And Abraham is married to Sarah. God's promised them a son. It's not happening. The years go by. And so Sarah has this plan. She says, you know what? Why don't you take my maidservant, my slave, Hagar, Egyptian, And why don't you sleep with her, Abraham? And then if you have a child, then that child can be mine and God's promise will be fulfilled. And Abraham goes along with it. And the story, if you look closely, is not condoning this at all. It's not saying this is a good thing. Actually, this turns into all kinds of turmoil and struggle. And Hagar, after conceiving and having a son, begins to be mistreated by Sarah, her master in that sense, And is sent away. And what happens? God intervenes. God intervenes and comes to Hagar and her son Ishmael. And he protects her. He provides for her. And he promises her a future. And she becomes somebody in the very beginning of the Bible who gives God a name. The God who sees. Hagar, what what would be considered in her context already then, the lowest of the low is someone who interacts with God, the angel of the Lord, receives mercy and grace and freedom, in a sense, from him and names him as the God who sees. And God, in doing this, is not condoning or promoting slavery, but actually freeing her and showing us grace in the midst of the mistreatment that was happening. A little later in Genesis, we get to Joseph. Joseph is sold by his own brothers into slavery ends up in Egypt again. In Egypt, he is a slave in the house of Potiphar. Seems to be doing well there. 
ends up being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of trying to assault her, ends up in prison for years, left destitute again. Then, through interpretation of dreams, ends up becoming the second in command in Egypt in such a way that God uses him to save the Egyptians from famine as well as his own family who've been brought into Egypt. And after several generations where Joseph is no longer remembered, the Egyptian people begin to take the Israelites, the Jewish people, and turn them into slaves. If you notice the book of Genesis, here we have an Egyptian slave, then we have a Jewish slave, then we have Jewish slaves in Egypt. It's just going back and forth. Everybody's enslaving everybody. And in the end, God rescues the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And he brings them into the desert and he gives them a set of laws. And here are a number of the laws that God gave the people of Israel who had been rescued, redeemed out of slavery. Number one, one of the laws. You cannot take people and make them into slaves by force. You cannot steal people, men or women, and enslave them. The penalty for doing so? Death. It's a capital offense to enslave somebody. Just along with murder and other things as well. God's making it very clear, not something that you should be doing. Another law, people who are slaves by economics. This is what bond servants is getting at here in this passage, which was the bulk of slaves actually throughout history. People who are too poor, couldn't pay debts, couldn't survive on their own. They would sell themselves to be slaves so they could pay off debt or they could actually make a living in doing so and survive. That people who are economic slaves were to be released every seven years, according to God's law. And not only released from their slavery every seven years, every seventh year, but they were to be given resources by the person they were enslaved to so they could make a new start. And every 50th year, they were not only to be released, but they were actually to have all their inherited land given back to them. On top of this, every seventh day, everybody was to rest, including slaves, male or female, foreigner, didn't matter who you were, you were to be given a day of rest. That God is making it very clear in all these laws that people who were enslaved were to be treated with respect, they were to be treated with care, and if you were to mistreat your slave, there's another law, then that slave was to be set free. That any kind of mistreatment of your slave was to cause that to be a complete and utter breakdown of that relationship where you mistreated them as the master and they were to be set free as a consequence. You say, well, what about slaves from other countries? Well, God has actually a law about that too, that when you would go to war and you would bring back, and this is what normally happened, the men were killed, they would bring back the women and children, that women who were of marrying age were to be given one month to mourn for their families and then if they were to be taken in marriage, they were to be given in marriage. They were not to be sex slaves. They were not to be treated as just concubines. That was not something God wanted to have happen at all. If it was to happen, they were to be married and they were to be given all the protections and the provisions and the rights of any married woman like any Israelite woman in Israel. And you take all these laws that God has put into place, it makes it very clear that God is not promoting slavery, but he is putting protections in place for those who are enslaved. Now you say, does the Bible then condone this? Well, as we look a little further and we get into the New Testament, here's what we begin to discover. Jesus treats people, whoever they are, no matter their station in life, whether they're slave or master, whether they are rich or poor, whether they are sick or they are healthy, it doesn't matter who they are, he treats them in a way that shocked people. Because he didn't give favor to the people who are wealthy or the people who are masters or the people who are healthy, but he actually spent most of his time going after the least and the lost, the slave, the people who are down, the people who are out, the people who are mistreated by others. And when Jesus described to his followers what it really means to lead, what it really means to be in charge, he demonstrated it on the night before his own betrayal from one of his followers, his own suffering and death on a cross. That night before, he demonstrates what it means to truly be a leader by taking water stripping off his clothes, going to each of them and washing their dirty, smelly feet. And when he gets up from doing so, he says, do you understand what I'm doing to you? What I'm doing to you is I'm showing you what it really means to serve, what it really means to lead. 
And Jesus began to put before them an understanding that the person who was to serve, in one sense we might even say to be a slave, was the person who was actually showing the kind of morality and integrity and love that Jesus wanted to be characteristic of his followers. And the disciples didn't miss it. Because when you begin to read what they wrote, the apostles, including the apostle Paul here, they actually began to describe themselves as slaves of Christ. The Apostle Paul begins many of his letters that way. The Apostle Paul, a slave of Christ. Peter describes himself that way. James describes himself that way. They all describe themselves as slaves of Christ. And the Apostle Paul, to make it very clear in this passage, as well as 1 Timothy, he actually mentions in 1 Timothy that the same law of the Old Testament, if you were to enslave somebody and put them in slavery, was also a sin right alongside murder. You can find that in 1 Timothy 1. He writes a letter, an entire letter, to a man named Philemon. And Philemon was a person who owned slaves. And one of those slaves, Onesimus, ran away. And having run away, Onesimus meets Paul in a different part of the world. And in meeting Paul, hears the good news of Jesus, becomes a Christian, and the Apostle Paul, hearing his story, eventually sends him back to his master, Philemon. And most likely, Onesimus is sent back to Philemon with the very letter we have in our Bible called Philemon. Onesimus, the runaway slave, who in punishment of death and other possible punishments as well, is sent back by Paul with this letter in his hands to his master. And what does the letter say? Paul says to Philemon, Philemon, Onesimus was formerly useless to you, I know, but he has found Christ. And as such, he is now a brother in Christ. I want you to receive him as a brother in Christ, not as a slave. And Paul calls himself a slave in that letter. In one sense, Paul is saying, I'll be the slave of Christ. And Philemon, this is now, Onesimus is now your brother in Christ. Treat him as a brother. Treat him as you would treat me, says Paul. And so over and over again, old, new, Jesus himself, his apostles, over and over again, the call is that we are called to, call, to, to look at people, no matter who they are, slaves or masters, and say, these people are made in the image of God. And this is why, if you look at church history, and I won't give you all the details, but if you want, you can ask me and I can give you more later on. You can start seeing it in the early church. They began to work towards more and more laws to end slavery. They began to work throughout the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century of this. By the 7th century, they were putting laws in place in Europe to try to end the slave trade. By the 13th century, they were actually making progress to end a slave trade that was done by the Vikings. And then sadly, what happens in history, as you look at it, is the church begins, begins to fade throughout the 13th, 14th, and into the 15th century and 16th, actually, to the point where it became very nominal. And most of Europe that was Christian was Christian, it seemed, in name only. And it's during that period of time that we see the Atlantic slave trade begin. The first time in history where we had the technology to transport people en masse to different locations. Because before this time, if you were a slave, you were most likely a slave of people who were the same race, the same ethnicity as you. And then it's at this point that we begin to see the massive removal of people from especially Africa, to North America, as well as to Arab nations and to Asia. And people are transported. They're sold by other Africans to people at the coast to be sold to slave traders and sent to other countries to work as property. And often in those days, people use the Bible to condone that kind of slavery. And it's Christians. William Wilberforce and others in Britain especially, it's Christians who in that time began the incredible work of saying this needs to stop. And eventually, even though they were called religious radicals by their own people, crazy religious people, they eventually saw the British government pass laws to end the slave trade and actually agreed to spend 40% of their budget at that time to nearly bankrupt them as a a British empire to end the slave trade and pay for the freedom of all the slaves within their empire. It was Christians 
who sought to end it because they finally began to realize more and more deeply that every single person is made in the image of God, that no one should be enslaved this way and no one should be mistreated or changed to be subhuman because of who they are economically or racially. And what we see is a beautiful picture of God's grace shining through in that moment, bringing clarity to the reality of what needed to change desperately in that time. And so the Apostle Paul's words here in this passage are not words that are promoting or condoning slavery, but he's saying the reality is this is where we are right now and how do we actually live differently if we're Christians in this time and in this place. And so what I'd like to do right now is look at this in terms of how this relates to us. Because the translation we're looking at today says bond servants obey your earthly masters. And what Paul's saying here is he's using the word slaves. And what the translators are trying to show here is that most people in that day would have been economic slaves. In that day, the vast majority of people were slaves. They worked their jobs. They were paid to do the work that they did. They used that payment to either pay off debts or they used that payment to survive. This was what it was like in their economy. I'm not condoning that. Neither does the Bible. That was what was happening. And I think the closest way that we could apply this to our lives today is, is simply this, that what Paul's about to say here to slaves, to bond servants, would be said to anybody here who is a, basically an employee, that if you work for somebody, that these words apply to you. And so let's look at those now as point number two. How does God call us as Christians to be employees, to be workers? And then how does it, in verse nine, as we'll look at this, how does this apply to masters? So bond servants, verse five. He says four big things that are called to do if you're a Christian in how you work. Number one, he says, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with sincere heart as you would Christ. And so the first thing, if you're an employee, if you work for somebody that you're called to do, no matter who your boss is, is to show a kind of respect. That's what fear and trembling are referring to, a kind of respect for your boss. And so the kind of making fun of your boss, mocking your boss, running your boss down and with fellow employees, having a great time doing so, which we often so often do, is something that God's saying to us in this passage today should not be done. That if we're going to love people around us, that should include our bosses. And we should work for them with respect and with a sincere heart. That we should care for them and care about what they're doing and how they're working. They were to listen and obey, to do what we're told to do. And not be insubordinate or constantly always questioning and thinking that we know better all the time. And what does Paul say is the grounds for this? earthly obedience and this fear and trembling, this respect with a sincere heart. He says, do it as if you're serving Christ, as if you're working for him. So here's the wonderful good news. If you're a Christian and you get up tomorrow morning and you go off to work or you start a shift later on today for work, if you're a Christian, you have a different boss than you think. Your true ultimate boss is Jesus. You don't ultimately work for the person you're working for. You do, but your ultimate boss is Jesus. And Paul's saying that means you need to obey and serve with respect and do your job well because Jesus is your ultimate boss. You're ultimately serving him, working for him. He says the next verse, that means you don't do it, verse six, by way of eye service as people pleasers. In other words, you don't just work hard when the boss is watching. What's the old phrase? When the cat's away, the mice will play. That's us when we're working, isn't it, sometimes? When no one's watching, we are busy wasting time. And you, can, you know how you waste time. I know how I can waste time. And Paul's saying, if we're going to be Christians and we're going to serve God, and ultimately Jesus is our boss, which is what he reminds himself again in verse 6, that we're to do it, the will of God from the heart, then ultimately what we're doing is we're serving a God who sees us all the time. That means when the boss is watching us and we're working hard, and then when he leaves, we're not working hard, our ultimate boss is still watching us. That Jesus doesn't go away. 
that he sees all that we do. And Paul's saying, in reality, if you're working for Jesus, then don't just work when you're being watched. Work all the time because you are being observed and watched all the time. Jesus, your good boss, is always there. And you're always ultimately working for him. And then he says to get at this a little deeper in verse 7, he says, and to render service with a good will. In other words, this is the idea of having a wholeheartedness to what you're doing and how you're working. That you're to do that as to the Lord and not to man. In other words, you might work. There's lots of good bosses out there and there's quite a number that aren't so great. You might not work for somebody who's so wonderful to work for. And what this passage is saying is you are to work wholeheartedly because ultimately you're not serving your boss first and foremost here on earth, but you're serving your ultimate boss, Jesus. That in the end, you're working for him. And he makes it very clear at the end that that's the case because in verse 8, he's saying, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. In other words, you will be ultimately rewarded by God. Your pay might stink. You probably deserve a raise. You probably should earn more or have more benefits. I'm sure all those things could be true. But Paul's saying you can still work hard, work faithfully, work diligently, work with respect, because ultimately your final and great reward will not come from your earthly boss. It will come from Jesus himself. And Jesus is the best boss that anybody could ever want. Because Jesus comes to us and says to us that you can actually be free from fear and you can be free from the enslavement that you feel and experience in this life because ultimately in him you are free. You see what Jesus is trying to get through here in this passage through the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit helping us understand this is that when he says that whether you are a bondservant or a free, you are actually free. You are actually somebody, if you are a Christian, who is not a slave. That's not your identity anymore in the world's eyes, whether you are enslaved in the world or not. But your truest identity is you belong to Jesus, and he is your ultimate boss, if we might put it that way. But he is the boss who is so different than any other boss because Jesus does this for the people who are enslaved. He comes and he frees them. And the kind of slavery he frees you from is not slavery to work or slavery to all those things first and foremost. He frees you from the slavery of the sin and the misery in our own hearts and our lives. It's why Jesus came and he says to his disciples and he said to the crowds, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. You see what Jesus is saying is he's saying, if you want to truly be free, if you want to be free to actually have a life where you can serve God no matter your circumstances, no matter your work situation, no matter your financial situation, that you can actually belong to the God who loves you, who has forgiven you, and the God who promises you that you will belong to him now and into eternity in a new heavens and new earth where you will work. But you will no longer work because you have to make money. You'll no longer work because you're forced to go and do a job you don't like, but you'll be able to work and serve God using the gifts and the abilities that he's given you to produce wonderful things, to give wonderful service to others that causes people around you to flourish and to grow in ways that God has always intended work to be done. You see, work is not a result of the curse. Work is not a result of sin. It's been frustrated by it But when God comes to redeem this new heavens and new earth and make a new creation, we will work and we will do so with joy and satisfaction and delight, serving God, our ultimate boss, who came and rescued us in his love and in his grace. And that leads Paul then to say in verse 9, well, what about masters? Because he knew that they were sitting both together in the church in Ephesus. And it's most likely that you are here today and you could be a master, an employer, someone who runs the show. And what does he say to us who are in that place? He says, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. Two parts. One, do the same to them. What does that mean? Well, it refers to what Paul was just saying. And he's saying, look, you want to be rewarded? Seek God's reward. Do what's right and what's wise and what's loving 
care for people, serve people, work hard, whether you are a slave, whether you're an employee, whether you're a master, whether you're an employer, whoever you are. And so he says to employers, he says to masters, work instead of thinking about your own bottom line, instead of thinking about your own business and your own legacy and all those things that get in the way, work in such a way that you realize that ultimately you too work for Jesus. That if you're a Christian and you own a company, that you're an employer, that you're self-employed, that you are the master in that sense, then you are called to be somebody who remembers that you work for Jesus. So in that sense, if you're a Christian, there is no such thing as self-employment. You work for Jesus. You're not the boss. And so in light of that, you're called to serve like God calls us to serve. You're called to adopt the same mindset that Jesus said to his disciples. Be willing to become the lowest. Be willing to get down on your hands and knees and do the work of the slave. Be willing to do the things that no one else is willing to do. And do so not because you're trying to lord it over other people, not because you're trying to be the boss, but because you're genuinely trying to love the people who work under you, who are working with you, because ultimately your boss is Jesus. That if you're a Christian and you're in a position of authority where you have people under you, whether you're a supervisor, whether you own the place or not, if you're in a place where people work under you, you are called by God to be people who do the same in loving people and doing good and not threatening them. In other words, if you're a Christian and you are a boss and you have people under you, what you are called to do is stop your threatening. In other words, you don't use fear as the motivator to get your employees to work. You don't threaten them by taking away their job or by firing them with, or, or decreasing their pay or taking away benefits or all those things. That is not how you are to operate as a Christian boss, as an employer. You are not to use threats to get them to do what you want them to do. How do you do it then? What do you do as a boss? Well, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear. You are called to obey and serve your ultimate master, Jesus, and that means imitate Jesus. Love your employees, care for them, care about them, invest in them. Do whatever it takes to help them grow to become the people they are meant to be in God's sight. That your ultimate desire and goal as a boss is not your bottom line. It's not your productivity. It's about the people that God has put in your path that serve and work with you and the people that you give and you sell your products to, that you would make products and services that are good for people, that are good for their flourishing, that are actually quality products in such a way that all that we do is pointing back, not to ourselves, not to how good we are, not to how wonderful we are, but to the God who has saved us by his grace and his mercy and his love. I think this is one of the most untapped areas of the Christian life in our culture today too many of us, if we're calling ourselves Christians here today, we'll start our day tomorrow. We might even do some Bible reading and prayer. Awesome. Please do it. If you're not, start. Great. Not the topic of today. But we're going to go to work, and too many of us work as if we work like everybody else. We, we act like bosses, like every other boss. Can anybody tell that you're a Christian by how you work? Can anybody tell you're a Christian in your company if you're a Christian? Do your employees know that? Not because you talk about Jesus or talk about going to church, but because how you actually love and treat people, how you actually deal with people in your business dealings, how you actually treat people in your contracts, how you actually serve people, how you pay your employees, how you work for your boss. Does anybody have a clue that there's a difference in your life because you're a Christian? Paul would say, if we really realize that Jesus is our ultimate boss, then there should be a difference. There should be a countercultural difference in the way we work hard, in the way we are faithful and serve, in the way that we care for each other, in the way that we provide for each other, in the way that we are trying to be generous to each other, in the way that we are actually trying to say that I don't have to hold so tightly to my job or to my business or to my company because this is not my life and identity my ultimate identity, if I'm a Christian, is that I belong to Jesus. And that means I can lose my job without losing my identity. That means I can lose my company without losing my identity. 
That means I can lose my ability to work without losing my identity. That means that no matter who you are, whether you're very young or you're very old, that your identity, your purpose in life is not found in how productive or how well you work, but it's in your heart's approach to serving God in whatever way you can, in whatever stage of life you can, so that you're living for Him, not for yourself, not for the bottom line, not for your bank account, not for your legacy, not for your reputation, but ultimately you're working for Jesus. And as you work for Jesus, you get filled with a different kind of joy and satisfaction in life because no one can take him away. And nothing can separate you from his love. Whether you're a slave, bondservant, employee, master, employer, whoever you are, that if you belong to Jesus, your identity is in him and finding your identity in him means you have a life that's much more secure, that's filled with a greater sense of satisfaction in your work, whatever it is, and filled with a joy and a hope that comes from knowing that ultimately you will one day forever work for him in a new heavens, in a new earth, with the gifts and abilities he's given you in ways that bring great joy, great satisfaction. And in the meantime, we serve him faithfully, seeing how great his love and his grace is to us. Let's take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, I confess it's easy to live day by day as if our work, as if what we do, nine to five, 12 hour shifts, 14 hour shifts, whatever we do all week long, is so different than what we believe and what we talk about other times of the week. Forgive us for making work something separate from you. Help us to see that you care about our work, that you care about how we work, that you care about how we treat people in our workplaces, and that you call us to be faithful, diligent, sincere, with goodwill in our hearts to our bosses and goodwill in our hearts to our employees, and a desire in our hearts ultimately to serve you. Father, help us today, in this week to come, to work differently to work for you, to work for your glory, to work in such a way that people would see you in how we work and that would cause them to see your grace and love, the grace and love that motivates us to work for you, recognizing your great love and the way that you have so wonderfully served us in Jesus who gave his life for us. In his name we pray, amen.